Ready, 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 ready. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to welcome all of you to this very special Time to Decide Summit. In the name of Erste Foundation and uh, IWM, uh, a very warm welcome to all of you who made it to this nice place out here, and to all those of you who follow us via live stream. We want to especially welcome the speakers and experts who accepted our invitation. A great lineup of distinguished personalities. I'm aware that there are even more experts present in the audience, but unfortunately, you see, we couldn't fit all of you on stage. Yet, you are an essential part of the summit as much as you are part of our work. I'm happy also to welcome here the Fellowship for Journalistic Excellence, uh, uh, Project Reporting Democracy, our Europe Future Fellows, which is fantastic, the NGO Academy alumni. Are you here? Are you here? Yeah, OK, great, great. And our transit curators, Ivan, Vevoda, and myself, Boris, hi. <laughs> we will lead you through the day and try very hard to take care of orientation and structure. This event is an outcome of the unique partnership between Erste Foundation and the Institute for Human Sciences in Vienna. It is a great example of sustainable collaboration between scientific competence and philanthropic ambition. We celebrate this partnership through the results we achieve together. Ladies and gentlemen, let me welcome you on behalf of the Institute for Human Sciences, the IVM, in Vienna in this year in which we celebrate the 40th anniversary of the founding of the Institute by our founder, the late Professor Krzysztof Michalski. A wholly unprovoked attack on a sovereign European nation of 44 million people. We are at the dawn of a new era forced upon the world by the Russian Federation war on Ukraine. Countries now take sides and choose between peace and aggression. The United Nations have firmly told Russia to end the ongoing bombings and attacks on civilians in Ukraine, and for all parties to respect the principles of the Charter of the United Nations, especially provisions on security and peace among countries. The fate of Ukraine is our fate today. There is a new reality that the Russian President Vladimir Putin has forced upon the world, requiring all states to make firm decisions and take a side. The choice is between justice and the will of the strongest. We are at a watershed moment or Zeiten Wende. The Erste Foundation and the Institute for Human Sciences in Vienna have together forged a partnership, and Boris already mentioned something, contributing ideas and policies to strengthen European unity, democracy, and the rule of law, to think together about Europe's futures, thinking Europe, debating Europe, acting for Europe, supporting a civic, democratic, pluralist vision of our continent. The address of our event location today is, as you might have seen, Otto Preminger Street. Now, who is Otto Preminger? Otto Preminger was one of the greatest personalities of the beginning Hollywood story in the 20th century. Fantastic director, 35 feature films, famous ones like The Man with the Golden Arm and Anatomy of a Murder. Otto Preminger was born 1905 in Vishnitsa, Bukovina. Today, Vishnitsa is a small town in the Ukraine. What a coincidence. Speaking of location, allow me to list a few housekeeping rules. This is not your typical symposium. This is a working meeting. We want to immediately dive into the content. The summit is taking place in a hybrid format. Therefore, please be on time as we go through the day. We have to follow a strict timeline, and we will try to keep the trains running. This is work today. We want to leave with the outcomes. Let's roll up our sleeves and get to work. <laughs> 
So this is work, huh? We do it. We do it. Yes. We did it. <laughs> How will the summit go about? The setup is more like a family table, a big one, I admit, than a classical conference. We want all the experts to be involved. Each chapter will start with two keynotes. One moderator per session will lead the discussion first among the people on stage and then with all of you. We have to be to the point, please, and concise. Okay? We are in wartime. And while we are gathering here free and secure, some miles away, people are dying in order to defend their country against the aggressor. Before we start working, let's please stand up and commence this summit with a minute of silence in commemoration of all those who lost their lives and their families and friends in this brutal war of aggression. Please stand up. Thank you. Alexander van der Bellen, the federal president of the Republic of Austria, apologizes for not being able to join us today. But he insisted in sending us a video message as opener for this summit. Let's listen to his statement. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Time to Decide Europe Summit. The flag behind me is the best known symbol for our common Europe, maybe even the most popular. It stands for our united Europe, a Europe that we all are constantly trying to develop further in a peaceful and solidaric way. Today, discussion about the future of the European Union is more necessary than ever before. Not only is the world changing at a rapid pace, Currently, we are also facing the numerous dilemmas posed by the raging war in Europe. This war is a humanitarian crisis of unspeakable proportions. Millions had to flee, lost their homes, or are in fear for their very lives. Then, of course, this war poses an economic challenge, not only to Ukraine and Russia. Needless to say, there are many, many more aspects to it. Additionally, in the grand global scheme, we are confronted with grave challenges such as the climate crisis, environmental pollution, or the scarcity of resources. To tackle any of these issues, we need to put our heads together. We need to work together. Just as this flag symbolizes, we need to make sure that its stars continue to burn brightly. Hence, I am glad Erste Foundation and the Institute for Human Sciences joined forces and co-organized this important discussion. Let us keep on working on this biggest project of peace, economy, learning and hope that exists in this world. I wish you an enriching day and fruitful discussions. We are particularly and deeply honored to have a message from Kyiv. Dmitry Kuleba, the foreign minister of Ukraine, has a last minute meeting with the president today. He was supposed to be live on the screen with us. This is why he sends his apologies for not being able to come online for a live call, but was so kind to send this video message. So let's listen to it and we're particularly grateful to him for doing it. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank the organizers for their invitation to address you today. War is a moment of truth, when black is black and white is white. Now, when this full-scale war drags on for almost three months, we should not forget how it started. 
It started with a petrifying lengthy speech that Putin gave as he ordered 240,000 troops to cross Ukrainian borders from all directions. He laid it all out. And it was hardly about NATO enlargement, or about Donbas, or about Russia's security concerns. These were all lies, and remain lies. Putin's speech was an imperialistic manifesto. It was about Ukraine being a mistake of history that should not have existed in his view. It, it was full of hatred and genocidal intent. The reason for him to give such an insane speech, without even trying to mask his real intentions, was that it had been designed for a blitzkrieg. He was simply so sure that in a few days the Ukrainian question would be solved once and for all and everyone in the world would simply have to accept the new reality. What happened next has astonished the whole world and will go down in history as a Ukrainian miracle, a David and Goliath moment of our times. The reason for Ukraine's successes is that this is a real people's war for us. Putin's speech and the massacre revealed later in Bucha leave no doubt. Russia's intentions are much darker than anyone could have imagined. We have no other option than to fight back, survive, and ultimately prevail. War is a moment of truth. A time to set things straight. We have warned the world for years that Russia wants war, not dialogue. We have shouted at every corner that Russia must be contained before it's too late. We have also warned of a global food crisis if Putin decides to launch an all-out war and blocks our ports. Our warnings have been mostly disregarded, and now we bear the fruits of it. This is why at this moment of truth we don't mince words anymore. Even me as a diplomat. My message is clear. Please, start listening to Ukraine. We all face some very challenging choices today. They require difficult decisions. Russia's war on Ukraine is not only about Ukraine, and we should act together in our and your best interests. If Putin hypothetically succeeds, he will certainly go further. Help us stop him now so that you don't have to later deal with him yourselves. We appreciate all the words of admiration, but we request some very concrete actions. Providing Ukraine with heavy weapons, imposing tough sanctions on Russia, and granting Ukraine EU candidate status. These are three shortest ways to peace. The only thing that is needed to achieve is the political will in key capitals. My work is to generate it. War is a moment of truth, and we need also clearly to see the big picture. Europe is changing. The global order will never be the same. A new world is being born out of the fires of this war, and it's up to us, Europeans, to shape it. Will it be an order when the might makes right? or an order where international law matters? Will we and our kids live in a century of war and tyranny or a century of peace and freedom? These are the questions that will be answered one way or another. None of you are spectators. You are all participants and decision makers. Help us craft a new and better world order. Ukraine is the center of the global fight for freedom. Ukraine fights for a better future, not only its own, but that of Europe. A future where governments are elected and accountable. A future where nations have a right to decide their own path. A future where freedom is the sacred value, both in the streets and online. A future where inventions, collaborations and ideas matter more than weapons, oil revenues and propaganda. Today we need to fight for this future and win it in a fight against tyranny and forces of the past, including with arms in our hands, because this is the choice we are given. 
We need all of you aboard if you agree with Ukraine's vision of the future for Europe. Join forces with us by a donation, a post, a demo, a demand for your government to act. The time to decide is now. Required decisions are clear. What we need is moral clarity and bravery. War is a moment of truth and the time to act resolutely. I count on all of you in doing so. Thank you all for your attention and wishing you a fruitful discussion today. One more, one more, then we start, one more. <laughs> um, Prime Minister of Estonia, Kaja Kalas, also wanted to send a message uh, to the summit in Vienna. Let's listen to her. Dear all, we live at the moment where aggression has come right up to the EU's borders. In fact, it is only a thousand kilometers from Kiev to Vienna. The warning signs were long there, yet it still caught many by surprise. What does war in Europe mean for the European Union? As is widely clear now, Russia is the most direct threat to the world order, and we are in this for the long haul. That's why we within the European Union, as well as the others in the free world at large, need to build a common new policy. It must be rooted in the understanding that it, this threat will not go away. First, we must continue to push back the aggressor and help Ukraine win. As President Zelensky has said, freedom must be armed better than tyranny. And we must avoid a bad peace. A badly negotiated peace for Ukraine would mean a bad peace for us all. While there is peace, the atrocities will continue. We must not give in to a war fatigue and false hopes that sustainable peace will break out tomorrow. Hence, it is important to equip Ukraine so that it could engage with Kremlin from a position of strength. Second, we must make sure the aggressor's appetite will be diminished and its war machine will be dried up. Our policy aim must be onefold. We must do everything to ensure that there will be no future aggression by the Kremlin into any of its neighboring territories. Our long-term policy must involve continued support for Ukraine's fight for freedom, while building up pressure against the aggressor with further sanctions and political and economic isolations. And we need to have a very clear understanding Putin and all of those who have committed crimes by starting and waging the war of aggression have to know that their judgment day will come. No impunity for war crimes must form a long-term cornerstone of our policies. Third, we need to make a huge leap forward when it comes to our own defense and military thinking. For the past 20 years, Russia has been building up heavy military presence behind Europe's doorstep. It has now stationed its troops into Belarus and uses it as its military base. Most importantly, the Kremlin has showed yet again strong willingness to use military force and take extremely high risks. This all means that there is no time to waste. NATO's defense in the Baltic Sea region needs a substantial change. We need significantly more combat-ready troops stationed in the Baltic states, more fighter jets in our skies and more ships in the Baltic Sea. I hope allies at the NATO summit in Madrid will make the necessary decisions in this regard. The unity of the free world is key for standing up against aggression next door. The key question is now, can we sustain it? Much of our focus will move towards holding on to this unity and avoiding war fatigue in the near future. We mustn't get tired. After all, Ukrainians are not tired. And it is the moral clarity of each and every one of you that helps drive policy discussions to the right direction. Stopping genocidal policies and aggression next door is a real litmus test for the European Union. And we all must suffer some pain and cost. 
We cannot fail here if we want the European Union to succeed and to develop into a truly geopolitical union. Living up to this role and establishing new policies demands that all of the voices are taken into account. Also, the frontline states are taken seriously. Those at the front line of the aggression or those who have experienced aggression in the history will have a different perspective from those with much better neighbors. Pushing back the aggressor is an essential question for us. Our neighbors' problems today are our problems tomorrow. When our neighbor's house is on fire, then our house could be next. I wish you fruitful discussions, hope to hear back about your ideas, and thank you. Now we start. Yeah. So, now we, now we start. Okay. <laughs> Uh, a huge thank you once again to President van der Bellen, Foreign Minister Kuleba, and Prime Minister Kalas. And they have posed many of the questions that we will be discussing. I will run very quickly through the five topics that we have chosen to address. These are the challenges that Europe faces, and that's why it is time to decide. The first one is how should Ukraine be rebuilt after the war? The second, pertaining to the region where I come from. What lessons can we draw from the Balkans? Thirdly, is it Central Europe's moment in Europe right now? And these are the countries that the Prime Minister talked about that are in the proximate neighborhood. Fourth, how will the European Union be transformed? A deep and very serious question that European leaders are addressing at the coming Council. And finally, and last but not least, what will the future be for Russia? We will go through the day, but now we will introduce today's participants on stage with yes. Boris starting from that end. I start from this end, you start from that end. So, we are very happy to have Olivia Lazar with us, visiting scholar at Carnegie Europe, Europe's future fellow at the Institute for Human Sciences in Vienna. Hi, Olivia. Our, <laughs> our film star, Jelimir Zilnik. Super that you are here, thank you very much. Serbian film director. Oh, now you. Uh, Boris got carried away a little bit. But that's yeah. okay. We're still waiting for Slavomir Sierakovsky. Slavic. Turn this way. We're hoping he I will. I think you should turn to the, this side. Okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> and I will catch up by introducing Anna Yermolaeva, who is here with us and is a Russian Austrian artist living in Vienna. Susanne Scholl, I think all, all who are Austrians here know her very well. Writer, journalist, and former ORF correspondent in Moscow. Next is uh, Dimitar Bechev, who hails from Bulgaria, was a Europe Futures uh, Fellow, and is currently at Oxford University. Please welcome Dimitar. Maxim Trudolyubov, editor of large of Medusa. Thank you for coming. Eh? Professor Stephen Holmes, who is a visiting fellow currently at the Institute for Human Sciences, but is also Walter Mayer Professor of Law at New York University. Welcome, Steve. Right. Thank you. My dear friend, Gerald Knaus. Uh, thank you that you're here, Gerald, chairman of the European Stability Initiative in Berlin. Karolina Vigura from Warsaw, Poland, who was recently with us at the Burg Theater. She is a sociologist and currently a Bosch Academy Fellow in Berlin and a member of the Board of Cultura Liberalna Foundation. Zuzana Zeleny from Hungary, a visiting fellow at the CEU Democracy Institute and director of the Democracy Institute Leadership Academy. Thank you, Susan. Florence Gaub, who is a newly appointed foresight advisor at the Council of the European Union and vice president of the European Forum, Alpach. Welcome, Florence. Nikola Dimitrov, great that we have you here. He is former deputy prime minister and foreign minister of North Macedonia, 
had a great role in the, in, in the talks with Greece, right, to find a solution for the future. Now non-resident fellow at the Institute for Human Sciences. Thank you, Nicola. <laughs> Allow me a very special welcome to the new rector of the Institute for Human Sciences, Misha Glenny, renowned journalist and author. Welcome, Misha. Natalie Tocci, director of the Instituto Affari Internazionali in Rome. Great, Natalie. Thank you. A warm welcome to Professor Serhii Plochi, who hails from Ukraine, but is the professor of Ukrainian history at Harvard University, where he also runs the Ukrainian Institute, Research Institute. Welcome, Serhii. So who doesn't know Ivan Krastev? <laughs> uh, permanent fellow of the Institute for Human Sciences in Vienna. Thank you, Ivan. Heather Graby, uh, a friend of many of us, is director of the Open Society Insti European Policy Institute. I never get it right. Welcome, Heather. <laughs> Marina Davidova, theater critic, director, historian, and producer. Thank you for being with us. A warm welcome to Christo Grozev, who is the CEO of Bellingcat. I'm sure many of you know about his platform and distinguished investigative reporting on many of the, may I put it lightly, misdeeds of the Russian Federation and its security services. Welcome, Christo. Maria, Maria Rochovets. She's an Ukrainian artist and she's from Bucha. Thank you for coming. Welcome to Olga Tokariuk, who is a non-resident fellow at the Center for European Policy Analysis, a think tank based in Washington, but Olga is from Ukraine. Welcome, Olga. Ivana Dragicevic, editor at large at number one. Uh, N1. <laughs> N1 Television from Zagreb. Thank you that you're here. And last but not least, Marta Pardavi, co-chair of the Hungarian Helsinki Committee. Welcome. Okay, so let's move. And uh, we are now out of the starting blocks. This is the first session. How should Ukraine be built uh, after the war? And I would love to welcome the distinguished moderator for this session, Olga Tokariuk. The whole thing is in your hands now, Olga. Mm -hmm. 